It's Wednesday, and you're listening to Warlock Wednesday on anyotherpodcast.com. Good evening, and welcome to another Warlock Wednesday, Warlock Hour with Razor. Um, got a big show today, big long things to talk about, so I'm just going to get right to things with the comic releases. Uh, DC Comics this week, the five comics I've chosen, are three of them are dealing with the Death of the Family series. As you know, I'm, I'm personally reading this one. I'm enjoying the series. We have three issues of this series coming out related to the return of the Joker. Uh, Batgirl number 16, Batman number 16, and Batman and Robin number 16. All three of these deal with the ongoing event, if you want to call it that, for Death of the Family, and uh, I will definitely pick, be picking those up. Two other issues to add into the five issues from DC that I'm looking forward to is uh, Superboy number 16. Personally not reading this anymore, but uh, it's still a good read for those of you who enjoy the young adventures of Superman, Superboy, whatever you want to call them. Uh, also, Suicide Squad number 16. Uh... My comic book store doesn't carry this very much, so uh, I hope to get an issue before they're all gone, but we'll have to wait and see when Wednesday gets here. Uh, you'll be listening to this on Wednesday, so hopefully you got your copy. From Marvel this week, all new X Men number 6, Captain Marvel number 9, and uh, Marvel now releasing another title, Savage Wolverine number 1. I'm definitely looking forward to that to see how that goes. Uh, Captain America number 3, Avengers Assemble number 11. Uh, not too many uh, comics coming out from the non-Big 2, meaning non-DC, non-Marvel. I got a couple, though, that uh, look interesting. Dynamite Entertainment is uh, releasing Kevin Smith's Bionic Man number 15. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Kevin Smith wrote a script for the Bionic Man to be made into a movie. That never happened. This was... Uh, I think he said about 20 years ago. But they've taken that script and they've now made a comic book series out of it. And this is issue number 15. Also from IDW Publishing this week, G.I. Joe number 21. So that's it for the comic news. I'm going to skip to a little bit of tiny little bit of gaming news this week. We don't do too many gaming news. It's... Um, hard to get some of the information that I want yet. I want to try and piece it together very well when I do it. But right now, the little bit of comic book news I want to get into is something that I started, I back believe, on episode one of Warlock Wednesday, was I was asking people who play World of Warcraft to donate $10 and get a in-game companion called the Cinder Kitten, and that this money was going to be going to the American Red Cross uh, for the Superstorm Sandy relief effort. Well, the numbers are in because that was for all of December, and December 31st was the last day that they were selling this uh, particular pet for the charity. Now, the game is still, like, Blizzard Entertainment will still be selling this pet, but unfortunately from this point on, the money does not go towards the, the Sandy Superstorm Sandy Relief Fund. However, what they did raise for the month of December, $2.3 million. So $2.3 million from, not from Blizzard, from people donating the $10 that they wanted to to get the Cinder Kitten all of that money, 100% of the proceeds, went to the Superstorm Sandy Relief Fund. So that means for one month, for 31 days, 230,000 cinder kittens were purchased, and all of that money, $2.3 million worth, went to this Relief Fund, and I think that's absolutely super fantastic, and that's why I wanted to report this little bit of gaming news, just because I thought it was absolutely amazing. All right, to the biggest section this week. Now, as I said, I, I don't know how long this is going to run, but there's a lot to cover, and that's the entertainment side. So I'm going to go... Uh, first thing we're going to do is uh, go to the, of course, the box office um, numbers for the week. I couldn't even get the word out. And uh, they were... A little bit surprising, yet not. Uh, as I said last week, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre got bumped out of the top spot. 
um, actually dropped quite a bit. You'll see that in a few seconds when I start doing the countdown. So number 10, uh, Silver Linings Playbook, which um, got nods for um, the Oscars this past week, and also, as we'll get into later, won a few awards at some award shows that have already happened. It's award season that's coming up all of mo most of January, right through up until the Oscars air in February. I believe they're in February. I think they're February 3rd. I think that's the Sunday. I could be wrong about that. I don't think... Now, now that I think about it, I think that's Super Bowl Sunday, so it might not be that. It might be the week before, the January 27th. I'm not quite sure when they actually air. I'll get that information, though, a little bit later. I don't have anything pulled up yet. Um, but number 10, Silver Linings Playbook, got some Oscar no uh, notice and got some awards this week. So it jumped up two spots from number 12 last week. And uh, what's helped this movie is uh, when when it opened, it opened on very limited screens. I believe a few weeks ago I, I had said it was only on like 71 screens. Well, now it's up to about 810. Uh, the increase in sales from last week to this week is over 38%. So people are going to see these movies that, that, that get the Oscar nominations, that get the nods. You know, people trying to fill in their list of seeing the top, the movies that have been nominated for Best Oscar, Best Picture Oscar. Those are always popular this time of year. So that bumped it up. Now remember last week, Texas Chainsaw was number one, dropped eight spots down to ninth place. 75% drop in, in money, made $5 million this weekend, 5.2, so puts it above Silver Linings, which made 5. Um, its take is about $30 million overall. Uh, it's, it's a movie that probably brought out a lot of more people than, like I said, I, it brought out a lot more than I thought. I, I personally thought the Texas Chainsaw movies were done. I, I, we've seen so many. Word of mouth says that this movie was enjoyable, but not great. And you got to remember, what, I think what bumped it up to number one was the fact that it's 3D, because it barely had the number one spot last week. So to say that it was a solid number one last week, no. But it was. It was number one. It made over $20 million. That's good enough for January number one. That being said, it has dropped down to ninth place. Moving down the list, uh, eighth place this week was Parental Guidance, which dropped from fifth, uh, making in bringing in six million. Uh, number seventh, up one spot, uh, Lincoln again, another Best Picture nominee, so it brought in a little bit more business. It, its numbers actually jumped seventeen percent from last week and made six point three million. Dropping another three spots this week, The Hobbit. I think we've kind of run the course for The Hobbit. And the staying power isn't going to be great. Will it cross the $300 million domestically? That remains to be seen. It still has a long way to go. It made $9 million this weekend, or 9.1. It's up to $278 million, so it could still cross that $300 million mark, which is always key when you're talking about movies uh, of this caliber. Uh, so... It, it could still pass it, but it's still got a long ways to go, and uh, as the numbers start to dwindle, it's harder and harder to get to that mark. Uh, moving up, or moving down in another spot, uh, fifth place this week, dropping from fourth, uh, Les Mis, Les Miserables, 9.6 million. Uh, dropping from second to fourth, uh, due to, uh, due mainly, I think, to the new releases, but still bringing in $11 million, Django Unchained, uh, again, a very excellent film. These two films, Les Mis and Django, I went to see them on the same day. They were both spectacular movies. If you haven't seen either of these movies, you should. Uh, Django may not be for everyone, but Les Mis certainly is. It's an absolutely fantastic movie. Uh, but if you want, if you're debating about seeing both of these movies, definitely go see them. They're amazing. And like I said, Django finished fourth. Uh, new release, Gangster Squad, came in at third with $17 million. Uh, This is the movie with Sean Penn and Josh Brolin, Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling. Uh, I still have not had the opportunity to see it. F from all accounts, it's a pretty decent film. Uh, it's very action or mob-oriented action type thing, you know, shoot uh, drive-by shootings and all that kind of stuff. They even changed part of the movie because uh, there was supposed to be a scene where... There was a shooting in the theater, and due to the Aurora incident when uh, 
when Dark Knight Rises came out, they didn't want that scene in the movie because it's still too... Like, even though that happened now last July, June, July, um, it's still fresh in people's minds, and they didn't want that scene in the movie, so they kind of changed that scene. The shooting now takes place outside the theater, makes it seem a little bit better, but still, uh, it's doing fairly well. Another new release that uh, my personal theater did not get, but it is obviously doing well, it's called. It's a movie called A Haunted House. Um, this is a film I don't know too much about, but it's um, it's a spoof movie. Uh, you know the Wayans brothers are involved with it, so it's you know it's going to be um, funny, entertaining to some. Uh, the main actors are Marlon Wayans, Cedric the Entertainer, Nick Swarsden, David Kochner, uh, all very funny actors and everything. So it's probably. Um, going to get uh, lower as the w- next week comes uh, and the new releases come out, but it made $18 million this weekend and my theater didn't even have it. So that goes to show you that just because a theater uh, movie doesn't come to your city doesn't mean it can't succeed. A Haunted House finished number two. Number one this week, up from 16th spot because it had a very limited release last week. In fact, uh, the increase in theater count was 2,877 screens, which means this movie uh, last week was, let's see, 2,877, just do some quick math, only was on 60 screens. So an 806% increase in money, and it came in with $24.4 million dollars. Uh, Zero Dark Thirty is, of course, the based on a true story of the hunt for Osama bin Laden, uh, starring Jessica Chastain. I don't know who else is in it. I know she's in it, but um, it's hard for me to watch a movie like that being Canadian. I think this is really more of an American movie. Uh, it's really gung ho America. I mean, don't get me wrong, I I was thrilled as anybody hearing the news that uh, SEAL Team 6 killed Osama bin Laden. Uh, Definitely a threat to everybody, not just the States. But um, I think this movie is more of an American movie. And for me, uh, they they don't interest me that much. And I'm sorry that uh, that's the way I feel, but... That's just the way I feel. It's Zero Dark Thirty is not a movie that I'm probably going to see. Uh, I know others will, and I hope you enjoy it. It's not for me. So those are the results from this past weekend. And uh, this coming weekend, three uh, re- movies being released. Uh, Broken City with Marky Mark and Russell Crowe, with Russell Crowe playing uh, a mayor who's probably corrupt, Marky Mark is playing a, an ex-cop who was corrupt, so it, it just seems like it's going to be um, quite the drama movie, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that, and I can't believe I said that, because I can't stand Russell Crowe, but, you know, Marky Mark's in it, so it's hard to say, but not sure when I'll see it, but I definitely am interested. It, it, it's a movie that does interest me. Uh the, Other movies coming out this week, uh, one of the other ones is um, The Last Stand, which means Arnie is back, people. He said, I'll be back. Well, he's back. Arnie, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Johnny Knoxville star in The Last Stand, which is basically about an old, old sheriff of a town where some criminal drug kingpin is coming through. He's like the last stand between this criminal and him escaping forever so go figure right Arnold Schwarzenegger and Johnny Knoxville so it's going to be some kind of action comedy I mean some people knock Arnold Schwarzenegger because he's like what in his 60s now Uh, you know what he keeps in decent shape he was a bodybuilder for all those years he's been out of the limelight for 10 years he's no longer the governator so I say let the man work. Like, I mean, maybe it's not going to be the greatest movies of all time that we're going to see. We're going to see Arnold Schwarzenegger doing Arnold Schwarzenegger stuff. He's going to do movies that he 
probably wanted to do but just didn't have the time to do and wasn't allowed to do while he was the governor of California. So maybe it's just time to let him do these movies. I mean, some of these movies are probably going to suck. Like uh, I'm, I'm thinking Triplets, which is the sequel to Twins. When, he, when that one comes out, I'm not too sure how that one's going to go. I mean, you've got... Uh, Danny DeVito is supposed to come back, Arnold Schwarzenegger is supposed to come back, and the third brother, the triplet, is supposed to be uh, Eddie Murphy. <sighs> Out of those three, I'd, I, I wouldn't mind seeing an Eddie Murphy movie if he was doing, you know, Axel Foley the way Axel Foley is supposed to be. Since he's not, if he's not playing Donkey, it's not going to be that great. So, to quote... Uh, Somebody I'm a big fan of, Ralph Garman. That is a movie that will suck. And I'm probably going to avoid that one. But this one here, it looks funny. Johnny Knoxville's hilarious. Arnold Schwarzenegger's in it. I know there's a few other actors I recognize. I believe Forrest Whitaker was in it when, when I saw the trailer. So it could be a decent action comedy. And you know what? In January, it's always hard to put out movies because all these movies that are coming out now probably won't even be talked about around Oscar time next year, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, the last movie coming out this week is a little horror film called Mama, starring Jessica J Chastain, who um, is playing a punk rocker in this movie, takes in a couple of little girls being haunted. I'm, I'm doing quotation figures. You can't see that because, you know, you're listening to a podcast and not watching me. But... Uh, she, they're being hunted by this thing that they call Mama, and this movie is supposed to be... It's based on a, a three-minute little short film, and uh, apparently it keeps a lot of that to it. So it's it'll bring in some money, but will it be in the top five next week? Hard to say. I think Last Stand and Broken City actually can crap... crack bleh, I can't speak. Can crack the top five. You know what that means, though. It's time for a drink. So, those are your movie releases for the coming weeks. Now, lots of entertainment news to get to. Um, for those of you who are Hunger Games fans like myself, the sequel, Catching Fire, is being filmed right now. And actually, they're probably just wrapping up film within the next little bit there because she's got to go, Jennifer Lawrence that is, when I say she, uh, she has to go start filming uh, the new X-Men sequel for... X-Men Days of Future Past. But um, they released online this week pictures of the wetsuits that they have to wear for Catching Fire because this one, the games, the quarter quell, is the third quarter quell of the 75th Hunger Games is going to be taking place in a water world type area. Like there's going to be actual underwater stuff. So, the, so part of their costumes is a, um, it's like a wetsuit. It looks like almost like a spandex wetsuit. is blue or gray and, and black and... Um, so they've released pictures of those online this week. They've also uh, shown pictures of the actor um, who's playing Finnick named Sam Claflin. I, I don't know if I'm saying that right. But uh, he's playing Finnick O'Dare. They have pictures of him released this week. So if you want to see these pictures, you can go to uh, giantfreakingrobot.com and uh, check them out. Not a sponsor, by the way, just uh, one of the new sites. They have pictures up there of uh, Finnick and Katniss Everdeen, who is Jennifer Lawrence. Uh, great movie that I'm looking forward to. Um, Paramount Pictures apparently are forcing J.J. Abrams to make Star Trek 3D. Uh, Star Trek 3D, or Star Trek Into Darkness, which is the sequel to the Star Trek reboot that J.J. Abrams did with such great success, uh, was making the sequel. He he shot basically. He shot it in 2D. He shot the movie in 2D. It's being converted into 3D. Uh, now, when he was told, basically, he was told by Paramount that they're releasing this movie in 3D. He 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 did not decide that. So before you go bashing J.J. Abrams because this movie is going to be in 3D, it was not his decision. It was Paramount's decision. They wanted. Uh, into Darkness, converted to 3D, and they said it's purely economical. We can make more money with the 3D prices. We want the um, we want that to be the way it's going to be. J.J. Uh, Abrams said, I have trouble with 3D sometimes. I can't see it right. I get a headache. It annoys me. I hate the glasses. I hate the fact that things get so dim. 
and you know, basically all the things that the most uh, fans or moviegoers are saying about 3D, which is. Uh, which bugs me because like 3D is like the new format. Everything wants to be 3D now, but most people hate it. But we still go see the movies, and you know what? As long as we're still going to see the movies, these companies are still going to put out these movies. The problem is they're not giving you the 2D option, so you have no choice to go but to go see them in 3D. In this case here, they are supposed to release the movie in both 2D and 3D, so it will. Uh, some theaters will carry both. Some theaters may only carry one. You have to check out your local theater to find out. Um, personally, hoping my theater carries both. We have 12 screens that we can show that that we can show movies on. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for a 3D one and a 2D one so that I can go see the 2D one. Um, so Abram goes on to say in this article, the key for me is I got to make my 2D movie that I wanted to make just the way I wanted to. And then it gets augmented into 3D, but that doesn't detract from the 2D. So basically saying most movies that are shot in 3D as opposed to converted 3D, um, have those like moments where things are coming at the screen. And when you're watching it in 2D, it just doesn't make sense because basically that's what they're doing. They're, they're doing these shots for the 3D effect. And most times, more times rather than not, those scenes didn't need to be in the movie. They're only doing it to utilize the 3D. So in this case, it's a 2D film. He shot it his way. They're going to up-convert it to 3D to give it depth, and that's pretty much it. So uh, that being said, uh, for those of you who are going to see it in 2D, there'll be no nonsense, nonsensical things being shot into the screen to make it look weird and out of place. So moving on from that, um, as we all know, Disney bought uh, Lucasfilms, and one of the things they, the first thing they did was announce that uh, Star Wars Episode Seven was 2015, coming out for sure, they were going to make it. Uh, now, ABC, which the, is the network that Disney owns, has announced, or not announced, but they said that uh, basically the long-time in-production proposed live-action Star Wars television series, it could happen now. Now that they uh, have the rights to Lucasfilms, they'd love to do something with that. ABC president uh, Paul Lee said, we're not sure what yet. We haven't even sat down with them. We're going to look at the live-action series. We're going to look at all of them and see what's right. We weren't able to discuss with them until the acquisition closed, and it's just closed. It's definitely going to be part of the conversation. So the fact that they're even thinking about it, it gets me excited. But the question is, where do they take this? What, what do we, what do we want to see as fans that would we would watch as a weekly episodic show that could last like five, six, seven years. You you want something that's going to last. That's what that's what producers, that's what uh, presidents of of networks, that's what they want. They want something that's going to last, have good ratings. So what as fans do we want to see? Uh, personally, for me, I'd love to see any live action series that does not include Jar Jar Binks. If it includes Jar Jar Binks, forget it. I don't want to see it. Um. I hate the prequels with a passion. I think if you do a live action series, maybe do something along the lines of like some of the side characters like I I can't even think of right now, but just not Jar Jar Binks. Do not include him, do not include the, the his race, do not include anything that was so bullshitty about the first 3 films that they released the prequels there, not the original 3, the original trilogy is amazing. Maybe they could have uh, somebody from the Rebel Alliance. Uh, we follow him. Like, hey, we, we could follow, like, you know, um, Biggs or Wedge or, or something else. Just don't include Jar Jar. That's all I ask, ABC. Don't include Jar Jar. We are sick of Jar Jar. Uh, sticking with kind of ABC, sort of, ish, um... Josh Whedon has confirmed that he's uh, almost done the script for Avengers 2. Uh, he's, he's done the outline. He's writing the script now. The script should be done in a couple of months. And that's good because he's got so much that he's working on. Uh, he was asked where he whether he's got a bigger template for the than the for previous film. Whedon said, 
don't go bigger, go deeper. The grand thing is that all of these people have met, so you have that out of the way. Now you can spend your time just digging in, and by digging in, I mean with a scalpel to cause pain. So we all know, it's been hinted, that Thanos is going to be the big bad of Avengers 2. So I think we're going to see some friction. We're going to see more we're, we're going to see more character development as opposed to the meeting. We're going to see more character development um in their interactions and that's going to be good. So and plus we still don't know what's going to happen with all the other um Marvel movies like how they're going to tie in because as we all know there's little bit, little bits of tie-ins for every one. We still got four more. Well, no, let's see. We've got one, two, Iron Man 3, Thor 2, Captain America, and uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. So yes, we have four movies that are going to tie in. So we still have little bits and pieces before we get to 2015 and, and Avengers 2. Um, he was also asked about the new S.H.I.E.L.D. show, Marvel's S.H.I.E.L.D., which is supposed to actually begin shooting um, a week from Tuesday. So about the 22nd of January they start shooting that. And that's a series that will be played in the fall. Um, he was asked about that. He uh, he said, you've got to bring a little bit of a spectacle, spectacle to it. I can't talk tonight. It's going to be bigger than your average cop show, but at the end of the day, it's about the peripheral people. It's about the people on the edges of the grand adventures. The whole point of this show is that even with all these big things, the little things matter. So it's about people who don't have superpowers. There will be some people with powers. There will be effects. The spectacle of science fiction storytelling but I'll play it on a very human, small level. And I think that's pretty much what we expected. If you expected more, then I think you're an idiot. Uh, but pretty much what we we, we expected. It, it's about the S.H.I.E.L.D. team. It's about the agents. It's not going to be about Thor, Captain America, Hulk's, um, uh, Hawkeye, any of them. It's not going to be about any of them. I was going to say Scarlett Johansson, but that's not her character name. It's Black Widow. <laughs> But, um, where was I? Yes, uh, the S.H.I.E.L.D. show is going to be about the agents. And speaking with that, I have another little bit of news from S.H.I.E.L.D., <laughs> so to speak. It was announced that S.H.I.E.L.D. will, in fact, take place after the, um, the results of the Avengers. So, uh, here's the little quote. Let me see if I can find it here. Okay, IGN spoke to ABC President Paul Lee, who said flat out the series takes place after the events of the Avengers. Quote, there is no question that it is part of the Marvel Universe. In fact, the story takes place after the battle for New York. So, like Whedon said, it's going to be on its own, and the agents are... Clark Gregg is going to be coming back as Coulson. He's going to be joined by Brett Dalton, who's going to play Agent Grant Ward. Ian DeKasticker, again, these names sometimes, as Agent Leo Fitz, Elizabeth Henstridge as Agent Gemma Simmons, Ming-Na Wen as Agent Melinda May, and Chloe Bennett as Sky. Joss Whedon is going to direct the pilot and co-write the pilot with his brother Jed and Jed's wife Marissa. And uh, so Coulson is there. The question is, how are they going to answer the question for us then? Remembering that we do have Iron Man 3 coming out in May, this would be a fall series. They could answer the question in Iron Man and then bring it full circle in this show. Now, when he said earlier that uh, there would be superpowered people, I think we're going to see some cameos. Uh, some point i think you have to get at least one episode early on with sam jackson playing uh nick fury um i think that would be wonderful i think that's something they gotta look into and i think that would be i think one of the first if not the pilot maybe the one right after the pilot episode two would have to have sam jackson in it uh one of those two episodes do have to have sam jackson in it to kind of tie it in, although, because you have Agent Coulson, Coulson's been the the linchpin through all these movies, maybe that's enough. I still think we're going to see some cameos from time to time. Disney has the big bucks to do it. Let's get it done. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, moving on. 
a good day to die hard. Valentine's Day, like it always should be. Bruce Willis blowing shit up. All right. Uh, one reason I am looking forward to this movie so much is that, according to sources, uh, the movie is going to get the R rating in the States, which means here in Canada, more specifically here in Ontario where I live, because all across Canada the rating systems are different, we should see a 14A to 18A rating. Now, this is significant because Live Free or Die Hard, the, Die Hard? Die Hard was the f third, fourth release, sorry, and it was only PG, or PG-13 for Americans. Um, this movie was, um, I enjoyed it. It was still good. When you bought the D DVD or Blu-ray, it was definitely, uh, it got the R rating put in because I think they added in the scenes and they filled out scenes like he does say yippee ki -yay, motherfucker in the, on the Blu-ray. Uh, I don't remember him saying it in the movies, but it, he very well could have here in Canada, but apparently he definitely did not in the States. So that being said, the first three diehards were all given the R rating in the States. So they're back to the R rating. They're saying, okay, you know what? We know what works. Let's do what works and not have this being a PG movie. So I'm looking forward to this. This is going to be my Valentine's Day since my girlfriend lives in Ireland. And even if she was here, we would be going to see Good Day to Die Hard. Because you know what? I have an amazing girlfriend. She loves these kind of movies. So you're looking for a date? A Good Day to Die Hard? Definitely a good Valentine's Day in my opinion. If you can find a woman that wants to see A Good Day to Die Hard with you on Valentine's Day, marry her. <laughs> All right. More movie news. <laughs> Walt Disney has announced uh, some of their upcoming release dates for movies that they have coming out. Just going to read off the list. It'll be quicker that way. Muppets 2 is now slated for March 21st, 2014. So we got a little bit of wait for that, just over a year, year and a couple of months. Uh, Captain America Winter Soldier is staying put on April 4th for 2014. Um, it's supposed to be in 3D as well. Um, I'll probably, again, hope that I can see it in 2D, not 3D. Uh, okay, I, this one I cannot pronounce. Maleficent, M-A-L-F-I-C-E-N-T. All I know is it's Angelina Jolie in it, and it's going to be in 3D. It was originally scheduled to come out March 14th, 2014, and is now being pushed to July 2nd, 2014. All I know about this movie is it's very heavily, heavily, heavily using special effects. That's pretty much all I know about it at this time. I can look into it more if, if we really want to, but I'm just doing the release dates. Guardian the Guardians of the Galaxy is coming out August 1st, 2014. That's staying the same. Again, that one's 3D. A lot of these movies are 3D. Uh, a movie called 1952 by Brad Bird is now coming out on December 19th, 2014. And Pirates of the Caribbean 5. That's right, we're getting a fifth one. July 10th, 2015. So good old Johnny Depp is going to don the pirate outfit again, which is um, oddly reminiscent of what he's going to look like this summer when we see the Lone Ranger and his Tonto outfit. It's not exactly the same, but I've, I I can see the similarities. A lot of people said, oh, I can't tell it's Johnny Depp. And when you first just look very briefly at his Tonto, you can't tell. As soon as he starts talking, as soon as he moves, you're like, hey, that's Captain Jack Sparrow. And that's how I saw it. Uh, one thing they did, uh, Disney did say is that The Little Mermaid, which was going to get a re-release into 3D as they've been doing with a lot of their movies on September 13th the, of this year, that is no longer happening. Now, whether it's no longer happening, period, or whether, or if it's just being postponed, um, this is all that's been announced, it's not happening. And you know what? Uh, it's, I, I hate the 3D, but this is one movie that I would have liked to have seen on the big screen. I was too young when it originally came out, 
or two not wanting not able to see it some something happened I never got to see it on the big screen I didn't get to see this movie till it was out on DVD and it is a wonderful kids movie and you know I may be in my 30s now but I remember the being the kid and enjoying The Lion King, enjoying Little Mermaid. You know, those kind of movies are what I grew up on. Monsters, Inc. was recently re-released into 3D. Just even listening to the music while I'm working, because I work at a movie theater, it's just wonderful. So a little bit disappointed that it's not getting the re-release. But like I said, it could just be a postponement. Uh, more movie news. Uh, the last little bit before I move on to a different segment of entertainment. Uh, the Assassin's Creed movie starring Michael Fassbender, who, by, by the way, is also co-producing the game and are pro- co-producing the movie uh, with Connor McCon. Um, they've hired a writer. Um, Ubisoft Motion Pictures and New Regency have hired up-and-coming British writer Michael Leslie to pen their big-screen Assassin's Creed adaptation. Leslie is an acclaimed English playwright who wrote Prince of Den- Denmark, which was performed at the National Theatre in 2012. The two companies are currently searching for a director to take on the film. So Assassin's Creed now has its star, its writer, it you know, needs a director. So I say get your ass in gear and get this picture made. I don't know if Michael Fassbender would be my first choice to play the Assassin's Creed character. I'm not sure which storyline they're doing. Again, they just hired the writer, so I don't know if he's going to kind of combine the games or if he's going to take a specific one or what he exactly is going to do. But when I picture the character from the first game anyways, Fassbender was not the first guy that came to mind. However, I think Michael F- Michael Fassbender will do a great job. And... I'm looking forward to this movie whenever it finally gets made. So, I mentioned earlier that it was award season. So, award season means there are many award shows that are going to be on within the next few weeks, usually on a Sunday uh, or sometimes Wednesday. Uh, there will be award shows, especially in the entertainment industry. You know, they award stuff for 2012, and that means lots of awards talk. So the first thing I'm going to do is something that I wanted to do ever since I saw this posting on um, Wednesday of last week. So when you're listening to this a week ago, the 33rd annual Razzie nominations. The the Razzies, for those of you who are unsure, is the Golden Raspberry Award Foundation. And they nominate not the best, but the worst of 2012. That's right, they nominate the worst. And the reason why I was so excited is because the worst includes something that I loathe more than most. And that's the Twilight series. The Twilight series, Breaking Dawn Part 2, leads the way in worst nominations. So let's get right to the nominations. Worst screenplay. The nominees are Atlas Shrugged Part 2. Battleship, That's My Boy, A Thousand Words, and Twilight, The Breaking Dawn Part 2. Worst Screen Ensemble. Nominees are the entire cast of Battleship, the entire cast of Oogie Loves, the entire cast of That's My Boy, the entire cast of Breaking Dawn Part 2, and the entire cast of Medea's Witless Protection. Worst Director. Nominees, Sean Anders for That's My Boy, Peter Berg for The Battleship Movie, Bill Condon for Breaking Dawn Part 2, Tyler Perry for Good Deeds and Medea's Witless Protection, and John Putch for Atlas Shrugged Part 2. Worst Screen Couple, any combination of two cast members from the Jersey Shore that were in The Three Stooges, uh, Mackenzie Foy and Taylor Lautner for Breaking Dawn Part 2, Robert Pattinson and Kristen Stewart for Breaking Dawn Part 2. Tyler Perry and his drag get-up in Tyler Perry's Medea's Witless Protection. Adam Sandler and either Leighton Meester, Andy Samberg, or Susan Sarandon in That's My Boy. Worst Supporting Actor, David Hasselhoff as himself in Piranha 3 D. Taylor Lautner in Breaking Dawn Part 2. Liam Neeson in Battleship and Wrath of the Titans. Poor Liam Neeson. 
Good thing he has a big dick. Nick Swardson in That's My Boy. And Vanilla Ice as himself in That's My Boy. Worst Supporting Actress, Jessica Biel in both Playing for Keeps and Total Recall. Brooklyn Decker in Battleship and What to Expect When You're Expecting. Ashley Green from Breaking Dawn Part 2. Jennifer Lopez for What to Expect When You're Expecting. And Rihanna for Battleship. Worst Actor, Nicolas Cage. Voted for two movies, Ghost Rider 2, The Spirit of Vengeance, and Seeking Justice. Eddie Murphy for A Thousand Words. Ready, Robert Pap Pattinson for Breaking Dawn Part 2. Tyler Perry Not in Drag for Alex Cross and Tyler Perry's Good Deeds. And Adam Sandler for That's My Boy. Worst Actress nominations, Katherine Heigl for One for the Money. Mila Jovovich for Resident Evil 5, Retribution. Tyler Perry in drag for Medea's Witless Protection. Kristen Stewart for Snow White and the Huntsman and Breaking Dawn Part 2. And Barbara Streisand for Guilt Trip. And for Worst Picture of the Nominees, Battleship, Oogie Loves, That's My Boy, A Thousand Words, and Breaking Dawn Part 2. Personally, I hope Breaking Dawn sweeps everything. Because it is the worst, and I know it won't, but still, I'm still hoping that they do. Now, moving from the Razzies, which is the worst, to the Academy Awards, which is supposedly the best. Now, I have a big problem with the Academy Awards. I don't even watch them anymore because I am sick and tired of the political bullshit that goes around. Now, I'm not going to go through every nomination as I did with the Razzies. There's not as many nominations for the Razzies as there are for the Academy Awards. But I am going to go over some of the, the biggies, starting with, excuse me, uh, the original song nominees are Before My Time from Chasing Ice, music and lyrics by J. Ralph. Everybody Needs a Best Friend from Ted, music by Walter Murphy and lyrics by Seth MacFarlane. Pie's Lullaby from Life of Pi, music by Michael Donna and lyrics by Bombay Jayashiri. Skyfall from Skyfall, <laughs> music and lyrics by Adele and Paul Epworth. And Suddenly, from Les Miserables, music by Claude Michael Schoenberg, lyrics by Herbert Kurtzmer and Alain Bubel. Uh, I'm probably pronouncing that name wrong. <laughs> so, moving on to um, Best Animated Feature. The nominees are Brave, from Disney and Pixar. Frank and Weenie, from Walt Disney Pictures. Uh, Paranorman, from Focus Features. Pirates, Band of Misfits from Sony, and Wreck-It Ralph from Disney. So Disney has a very good chance of winning here with three nominations being Brave, Frank and Weenie, and Wreck-It Ralph. And uh, if I were to pick, it would be a tie. Brave and Wreck-It Ralph were absolutely phenomenal films. So moving on, I'm going to do the writing just because uh, there's two separate writing categories, but I am going to do them. Uh, writing original screenplay, the uh, nominees are Amour, written by Michael Haneke, Django Unchained, written by Quentin Tarantino, Flight, written by John Gatt Gattins, Moonrise Kingdom, written by Wes Anderson and Roman Coppola, and Zero Dark Thirty, written by Mark Bowl. The adapted screenplays go to nominations of Argo, written by Chris Terrio, Beasts of the Southern Wild, which I've never heard of, written by Lucy Alibar and Ben Zaitlin, Life of Pi, written by David McGee. Lincoln, written by Tony Kirshner. And Silver Linings Playbook, written by David O. Russell. And now to the big, kind of, big five. Uh, or big six, I guess. This is the last little bit here. Uh, actress in a supporting role. Amy Adams for The Master. Sally Field for Lincoln. Anne Hathaway for Les Mis. Helen Hunt for The Sessions. And Jackie Weaver for Silver Linings Playbook. Actor in a supporting role, Alan Arkin for Argo, Robert De Niro for Silver Linings Playbook, Philip Seymour Hoffman for The Master, Tommy Lee Jones for Lincoln, and Christoph Waltz for Django Unchained. Actress in a leading role, Jessica Chastain for Zero Dark Thirty, Jennifer Lawrence for Silver Linings Playbook, Emmanuel Riva for Amour, uh, oh, oh, oh. Quavenshani Wallace for Beasts of the Southern Wild. Again, never heard of the movie and can't pronounce that name. Naomi Watts for The Impossible. 
Actor in a Leading Role, Bradley Cooper for Silver Linings Playbook, Daniel Day-Lewis for Lincoln, Hugh Jackman for Les Mis, Joaquin Phoenix for The Master, and Denzel Washington for Flight. Best Director, Michael Haneke for Amour, Ben Zaitlin for Beasts of the Southern Wild, Ang Lee for Life of Pi, Steven Spielberg for Lincoln, and David O. Russell for Silver Linings Playbook. And the nominees for Best Picture, Amour, Argo, Beasts of the Southern Wild, Django Unchained, Les Miserables, Life of Pi, Lincoln, Silver Linings Playbook, and Zero Dark Thirty. Now, before I continue on, I want to say this is fucking bullshit, because I've never heard of this movie called Beasts of the Southern Wild, which I'm guessing is a foreign film, which is fine. It's probably low budget, which is fine. I've never seen it in the top ten, which is not fine. Um, I get sick and tired of these independent movies that don't make any money, that only critics seem to like that people have never heard of uh, get nominations over other things and other people that might deserve it. Now, granted, the movie Argo did get nominated for Best Picture. However, Ben Affleck did not get nominated for Best Director. Yet, by all accounts... And I haven't seen all these movies, but by all accounts, it was a fantastic film, and he definitely deserves not only the nomination, but probably the Oscar for it. He won't win it because he's not nominated. Now, that's not to say that Argo won't win Best Picture. It very well could. It's got some stiff competition. Apparently, Beasts of the Southern Wild is fantastic, whatever it is, because it got a Best Director Oscar nomination. <coughs> Excuse me. But the thing is, I am so sick and tired of them pigeonholing people. Ben Affleck is never a fantastic actor. He's had some good movies, he's had some horrible movies. We all know what happened with Geely. However, as a director, his track record has been unmatched. He's directed... His last three movies that he's directed have all been cinematic masterpieces. They've all been talked about very highly by everyone in the industry. And Argo is probably one of the best. So, why didn't he get the nomination? Because it's political bullshit. And that's why I do not watch the Oscars. That being said, when the Oscars happen... I will report back with the winners and still be pissed off that Ben Affleck was nominated. So, that being said, I'm going to move on to the People's Choice Awards. The People's Choice Awards took place January 9th on a Wednesday. I'm not going through the entire list because there's so many awards. However, I am going to do some of the ones that... Uh, were picked. Now, the People's Choice Awards were voted on by the people. No, uh, no critics, no journalists, no directors, nobody else votes on them, but people go online and they are able to vote. Now, you can tell the kind of people who actually pay attention to these by what won, because I disagree with quite a few of them. Uh, favorite movie, my favorite movie, as I talked about in a previous episode from 2012, was The Avengers. Now, every movie that was nominated except for one was on my list of top 10 movies for 2012. The movie that won, I'm not disappointed it won. I still don't think it was the best movie, The Hunger Games. I thought it was a very good movie, and the people spoke. They definitely... Uh, voted for the Hunger Games, which tells me a younger crowd does watch the People's Choice Awards. Or at least votes for the People's Choice Awards. And it's also a lot of uh, Americans voting, and uh, as I found out with The Voice, they don't always like what I like. In fact, they they downright I downright usually loathe what they like. But, you know, I can't do anything about that. I can do... I couldn't vote for The Voice. I I did vote for the People's Choice Awards. Uh, I picked The Avengers. Um, 
one of the things that pissed me right off was, uh, well, okay, maybe not piss me right off. I'll get to that part later. But one of the things that got me really upset was favorite fan following. And that was the Twihards from Twilight. Well, I call them the Twitards. They're moronic, they're idiotic, and anybody following the Twilight series are stupid people. You're rooting vampires, and you're making a second-rate author seem fantastic. Sorry, that's the way I feel. Personally, I would have even would have chose Harry Potter fans, or Lord of the Rings fans, or Hunger Games fans over the Twilight fans any day of the week. Favorite action movie? Again, I would have picked The Avengers. Unfortunately, it was The Hunger Games. Excuse me, but I've got an alarm going off. All right, there we go. <laughs> That's that settled. See, so an alarm's going off now in the middle of talking. Okay, now where was I? Yeah, so favorite action movie was again voted The Hunger Games. I would have chosen The Avengers. Uh, favorite action movie star? Chris Hemsworth. I can agree with that. Personally, I would have voted for RDJ, Robert Downey Jr. Love him as Iron Man. However, Chris Hemsworth, I'm okay with that. Favorite movie franchise, Hunger Games. Again? Yes, again. Unfortunately, The Dark Knight, The Avengers, Madagascar, and Spider-Man did not qualify because they were the first or last ones of their series I don't know, because The Hunger Games is the first one of their series. So, favorite movie franchise, Hunger Games has one movie. Avengers had four movies leading into it. The Dark Knight, uh, or the Batman trilogy, whatever you want to call it, has three movies. Madagascar has three or four movies. The Spider-Man, while it's a reboot, still had a whole bunch of movies. Yet, The Hunger Games gets voted favorite movie franchise. Okay, whatever. Okay, now here's where I got pissed off. Favorite comedic TV actor, Chris Colfer. Favorite comedic TV actress was Lee Michelle. Both of those assholes are from that fucking show Glee, which I freaking hate. I hate Glee with a passion. I cannot stand it. It's a piss poor excuse for a show. It's this. Oh, it just pisses me right off. I want to choke everybody who watches that show. You're ruining TV. Yes, people are watching it, so it's popular. But you know what? If you are not a 14 to a 19-year-old girl or boy in high school, you should not be watching this show! It's stupid! It's moronic, and you're keeping it on the air! God! What pisses me off the most about this shithead winning comedic TV actor is he was against Jim Parsons and Neil Patrick Harris, both of whom could be funnier in their sleep than this moron who won. <sighs> okay. Moving on. If I can. Okay. Okay. <laughs> favorite sci-fi fantasy TV show Supernatural um no first of all that movie has gone downhill since season 3 uh I even find it hard to watch the show right now I'm about 4 or 5 episodes behind I'll probably do what I did last year and just catch up at the end but considering it was against Doctor Who and The Walking Dead you can tell again who are voting for these shows Mostly females, and mostly teens to uh, young adults. Because Doctor Who and Walking Dead should both be ahead of Supernatural, with probably The Walking Dead maybe just edging out Doctor Who. Um, another one, favorite comedic movie actress, Jennifer Aniston, considering the competition, probably a good choice. Uh, favorite movie actress that's not comedy, Jennifer Lawrence. Oh, she's beautiful. All these actresses were absolutely beautiful. Anne Hathaway, Emma Stone, Jennifer Lawrence, Mila Kunis, Scarlett Johansson. Throw a dart, pick a winner. That's I, I can I can accept Jennifer Lawrence as favorite movie actress. Um, 
Favorite dramatic TV actress, Ellen Pompeo. Maybe not my first choice. However, favorite dramatic TV actor, Nathan Fillion. Yes, the man gets some respect now. Uh, he won for Castle, of course. Favorite face of heroism, Jennifer Lawrence in The Hunger Games. Now, like I just said, throw a dart and you could almost choose a winner, except in this case. Kristen Stewart was nominated for Snow White and the Huntsman. Seriously? Favorite face of heroism? Thank God nobody voted for her. Favorite pop artist, Katy Perry. And favorite um, fans, apparently, the Katy Cats. Katy Cats, whatever she wants to call them. Apparently, they were definitely the cat's meow, so to speak. <laughs> they were the, voted the favorite fans. Um, favorite dramatic TV show was Castle, which was awesome. I loved that show. And uh, I'm just going to wrap the People's Choice Awards up with favorite dramatic movie actress, Emma Watson. How far has she come since playing Hermione? She played Hermione for 11 years her first real role outside of the Potter universe, Perks of Being a Wallflower, she wins Favorite Dramatic Movie Actress. Two thumbs up for Emma Watson. Moving on to the Golden Globes, which just happened yesterday for me, Sunday for those of you listening. Uh, I am going to go through as much as I can. However, I want to try and narrow it down. Uh, as I said, this is getting a little long. I knew that this was going to be a long show, but that's okay. That's what we've got podcasts for. So I'm just going to go through the list as quickly as possible. Now, I'm just going to do the movie side of things. I'm not going to do the TV side. So Best Original Score, uh, Life of Pi. Best Original Song, Skyfall from Adele from the movie Skyfall. Best Animated Feature, Brave. Now, remember what I'm saying. Uh, the nominations, well, first let me say this. The Golden Globes, while they don't totally influence the Oscars, you'll see a lot of the same winners when the Oscar awards are handed out, when the Academy Awards are handed out. So the fact that Brave won here, and I said Disney had the top, like, had three in the top five for the Academy Awards, I think that uh, Brave has a good shot of winning the Academy Award with Wreck-It Ralph, definitely got to be close second. It was just a fantastic movie. Uh, best screenplay went to Quentin Tarantino and for Django Unchained. The best supporting actor also went to Django Unchained. Hit the star or co-star of that, Christoph Waltz, who was absolutely phenomenal. I thought he was amazing in the movie. Best supporting actress went to Anne Hathaway for Les Mis. I can definitely see that. Best actress in a musical or comedy, Jennifer Lawrence won for Silver Linings Playbook. Best Actor in a Musical or Comedy, Hugh Jackman won for Les Mis. Best Actor in a Drama, Daniel Day-Lewis for Lincoln. Best Actress in a Drama, uh, Jessica Chastain, Zero Dark Thirty. Best Director, guess who won Best Director, everybody? Ben Affleck for Argo, and he didn't even get a fucking nomination for the Academy Award. Urgh! Urgh! That's why I hate Academy Awards. They don't recognize talent. They just... Vote with their stupid mind. They don't even... They don't vote with their mind. Sorry, they vote for stupid crap that they see that nobody else sees. And then they're like, Ooh, let's pick that one because it looks good. Oh, don't worry. It'll make one dollar, maybe. Ben Affleck for Argo. Thank you, Golden Globes, for giving the respect where it is due. Ben Affleck, you would have bombed Phantoms, yo. Okay, best musical or comedy was uh, Les Miserables, and uh, considering its competition, I I think the only competition it really had was Silver Linings Playbook. And best drama was Argo, which is kind of where your best picture fits in, which is why I think Argo is probably going to win the best picture for the uh, the Academy Awards. So I had some frustrating moments this past week in the awards. Uh, however... The Razzies didn't let me down by nominating Twilight in almost every category, which is just super fantastic. But uh, the rest of the way, you know, I can stand when a person I like loses. But when a person that deserves to be nominated isn't nominated, or when people who are definitely not funny 
and they're winning awards over people who are definitely funny, that does piss me off. And yes, I get frustrated and I rage. That being said, I'm going to move on from entertainment news and move into the last little bit segment here, some sports news. I want to start in baseball, just a little snippet, not a huge into baseball right now, being that it's January and wintry and cold. However, uh, the Hall of Fame uh, gets players that are eligible every year, and this year is the first year in 17 years that no one, absolutely no one, got elected to the Hall of Fame. Uh, Some of the guys that are missing out are basically a lot of the steroid users, the ones that were involved in steroid allegations, Barry Bonds, Sammy Sosa, Roger Clemens, and um, that probably played a factor. However, there was one player this year, Jack Morris. Um, I think that he probably should have got in, but because his name isn't as high profile as some of the others. I think the steroids played quite a big factor this year, and the journalists and sports writers uh, were trying to make a statement, I guess, since these uh, players were available to be elected, and no one, excuse me, no one is going in this year. I think that's why Jack Morris doesn't get in this year, but I believe that he should get in in the future. Um, A little bit of NHL news. Uh... NHL season starts January 19th. I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited, even though I said earlier in earlier broadcasts that uh, I thought there would be no season. Um, Gary Bettman, who's still an asshole and I think should still be fired, uh, he and Donald Fear, who was another person I think should be fired, uh, came to an agreement. Uh, It was ratified by the owners first and then by the players this past weekend. Training camps opened yesterday, that being yesterday Sunday, not yesterday Tuesday when you're listening to this on Wednesday. But uh, Sunday, training camp started, and uh, they're in full swing. By Wednesday, they'll have been four days in training camp and three days before the season starts. So Saturday afternoon, there's a whole slate of games on the schedule. I am a Leafs fan, so as a Leafs fan, I'm looking forward to the Toronto Maple Leafs versus the Montreal Canadiens in Montreal. I always have a bet every year with a friend of mine to see which of our teams will have the best record against the other. Like, basically, who could get more wins against the other? We've been doing this bet now for this will be the sixth season in a row. The previous five seasons, because these teams normally play each other an even amount of times, for the first uh, year, two years of our bet, it was eight times they played each other. And they each won four games that year, so they split, so nobody won the bet. Uh, The last three years of the bet, uh, because, yeah, the last three years of the bet, they've played six games against each other and, again, split three and three. So they, as as bad as the Leafs have been, they're always up for the challenge when it comes to the Montreal Canadiens. So it, it doesn't really matter where they are in the standings. These two teams always play each other tough, And I'm looking forward to a great series this year. However, this year someone will win the bet. Simply because uh, of the shortened season, they're playing each other only five times, so it won't be an even number. Somebody is going to win at least three games, and the other team will win two. It could be 4-1, it could be 5-0. But somebody is going to win the bet this year because because there is a win in hockey now. There's no more ties. They go to OT, and then they go to a shootout. So since there's no more ties... um, there is going to be a winner. Uh, another NHL note, on Friday, the Toronto Maple Leafs fired long, uh, one of the probably greatest NHL GMs of all time in Brian Burke. A lot of people are speculating why Brian Burke was fired. Uh, some people have said that uh, because he couldn't make the trade for Luongo, Uh, Other issues have come up, but uh, I think there's three key issues why he was fired. One, the Leafs have not made the playoffs under his regime. He was GM for, what, three and a half, four years, four and a half years. Uh, He never once made the playoffs as a GM. Uh, The closest he came was 10th place in the Eastern Conference, and that's not really close when you think about it. Uh, I think that was one key issue, not making the playoffs. Another key issue, I don't think he was able to 
uh, get a deal done to acquire Rick Nash. I think getting Rick Nash in this past off season might have done something to maybe solidify his his tenure and maybe at least given him this 48 game season to see what he could do. And I think the final and probably the more likely reason, uh, other than the missing the playoffs, because obviously that's important, but the new ownership, who is now uh, a three-way ownership with um, uh, Larry Tannenbaum owning 25% of the team, and then the uh, other 75% is split between Rogers and Bell, two of the biggest conglomerates here in Canada, and... Um, I think they basically didn't like his style, especially the way he interacted with media, and they're both media outlets. I don't think they like like liked his style at all, and uh, he's not going to change. He's a stubborn Irishman. He said it many times before. He's not going to change his style. He's not going to change his brand, as he called it. Uh, but I think that played a big issue. I think the worst part of this firing is the timing. Nobody has said why. I think if it was done sooner, now, to be fair, the owners took over in August, and then the lockout happened in September, so maybe there just wasn't enough time between the owners taking over in August and, and that September deadline when the lockout happened, because when the lockout happened, that changed everything. Like, they couldn't do anything, they didn't want to do anything. So, uh, I, I think that's how this we came to this decision at this time. The lockout was over, it was official, and boom, fire Burke. So... I want to wish good luck to Dave Nonis, who's taking over. I would like to see him continue to build what uh, Burke started, because I know it's going to go a different direction. Whenever you have GM change, it always does, but uh, Dave Nonis has been a big friend of Brian Burke's for such a long time that they, they obviously have similar things, and I mean... Nonis was in there and probably was involved in a lot of the decisions since he's been brought in for the three and a half years that he was there of the four and a half tenure of Brian Burke. So I, I think that um, he's probably got more fingerprints on the makeup of the Leafs right now. So to continue to build on what's there, uh, whether they go out and get Luongo uh, remains to be seen. Personally, I don't. I don't know if I want Luongo. Yes, he's a great proven quarter uh, quarterback. I'm wrong sport. He's a great proven goalie. However, he'll get the Leafs into the playoffs. I think that's a given, but then he'll choke. It's what he does. He chokes in the playoffs. Uh, no offense to the man. He's won a gold medal for Canada, but he chokes in the playoffs, and that's a fact. You look at his time spent... I don't even think he made the playoffs in Florida. That was such a while ago. But the, his time in Vancouver, every time they made the playoffs... He chokes. He he gives up huge games, and it's not like like even when they were in the Stanley Cup final, like to to have. I think they had a three one lead at one point, uh, three games to one lead, and Boston roared back and just shell shocked him. Like I mean, seriously, maybe it wasn't three one. It might have been three two. But still, he, they they roared back to win the last two games, and they 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 just pelted him with goals, and then and then they get eliminated by the Los Angeles Kings, who. Granted, went on to win the Stanley Cup last year, but they were the first place Predators Trophy team winning team, the the Vancouver Canucks, that is, and they lost to the eighth place, squeaked into the playoffs, uh, Los Angeles Kings. Now, all playoffs is usually hottest team at the right time, and definitely the Kings were that. I mean, Jonathan Quick was phenomenal. I keep trying to get him in my fantasy drafts uh, for fantasy hockey this year, and he's sometimes hard to get. I usually end up getting Lundqvist if I can get a goalie uh, in the first round if I don't draft like first overall, because you know Steven Stamkos is number one in my mind as a first overall pick. But um, to... To try and get Jonathan Quick is so hard because he's such a great goalie and he's so young. So, I mean, hopefully he can continue this play because he's going to be a good goalie for many years to come. But uh, I don't even know if I want Luongo to come to Toronto just because he's just going to choke in the playoffs even if, as soon as they get there. So it's not great. Now, there's other goalies on the market, possibly. I mean, you look at St. Louis, has two great uh, goalies, Bill, uh, Brian Elliott and uh, Yaroslav Halak. Um, whether they're willing to trade one remains to be seen. They could flip-flop them like they did last year. Uh, injuries could play a factor, so teams might want to not, might not want to do that. Uh, over in L.A., there's Jonathan Bernier, but again, another young guy. I personally think that if Reimer is healthy, 
If Reimer can stay healthy for, for the, the, this 48 game stress and Skirvins can come in to spell him every, like, maybe five games, he gets in, like, what? So, two, three, four, two, quick math again. Maybe eight to ten games so that, uh, uh, Reimer is only playing about a 38 game schedule as opposed to the full 48. And 38 games, uh, when you think of an 82 game season, is pretty, pretty damn good. Uh, it's actually even a little low. But 38 games in a 48 game schedule, you're still playing a high percentage of the games. You're you're still doing everything you can to uh, to help your team win. So I, I would be okay with Reimer and Scrivens this year, and then maybe do something in the off season depending on how the year goes. I think that if Reimer returns to form the way he was at the end of the two seasons ago and the beginning of last season, then I, I think the Leafs have definitely uh, a solid goaltending option. It's just that with the way things were last year, it was really tough to gauge his medal because, like I said, he was hurt a lot, and they were interchanging goalies a lot. So, I mean, I'd be okay with Reimer and Scrivens as long as Reimer can be healthy and stay healthy, then I, I think the Leafs have a chance. Moving on from hockey, we're going to move into football, and football had its playoffs. I went two for two this week. Uh, perfect four for four in week one of the playoffs, but two f two not sorry not two for two two for four. Um, I picked Denver to beat Baltimore, and they lost the game. Uh, Baltimore did not win the game. Denver lost the game. That's how I'm seeing this. Uh, Peyton Manning threw an interception in overtime that basically cost them the game. You, I know, like, like when, you, when you're playing, like, the game in the first four quarters, you can throw an interception, and as long as it's not the last play of the game, you always have a chance to come back. You always have a chance to get the ball back and, and do something with it right away. You throw an interception in overtime, it's game over. Uh, I like Peyton Manning. I think, he's, I think he's still a great quarterback, even at 38 years of age. I think next year he's going to be putting up the same kind of numbers he put up this year. But you can't do that. And he did. So Denver lost the game. Baltimore's moving on to the AFC Championship game. In the other AFC game, New England is who I picked. New England is who won. They beat Houston in the regular season 44-10. to They beat New Houston in the postseason 41-28. I hate New England with passion. I hate them so much. They are the I hate them almost as much as I hate the New York Yankees. No, probably more than I hate the New York Yankees. I loathe this team. I hate their quarterback. I think he's uh, a jerk. I think he's an idiot. I think their coach is a cheater. And I will never have respect for their coach ever again. I don't care what he does from from that point forward. From that from that time that he cheated till the day he dies. I will never have respect for that man. He's a cheater, and he should have been fired on the spot. I I, I hate him. I, I can't stand the New England Patriots. I think most of their fans are fucking posers. They are bandwagon jumpers. They never attended games when they were losing. They only started attending games when they won the Super Bowl. I'm sorry, but that's not a fan. That's bullshit. I've been a fan of a losing team in almost every major sport. For the past 20, well, okay, not 20 years, but for the past long, long, long time. Let, let me put it to you this way. I'm a big fan of the Buffalo Bills. They haven't been to the playoffs since 2004. The last time they were in a Super Bowl uh, was um, probably, I, I'm i going to get the date wrong, so I'm not even going to say. They went to four straight Super Bowls and lost. They've never won a Super Bowl. They are still my favorite team. I don't care what anybody says about them. They are still my favorite team. I'm a Toronto Maple Leafs fan. They haven't won a cup since 1967. I wasn't alive in 1967. In fact, I was still nine years in the making. I will. I have never seen the, the Toronto Maple Leafs win the Stanley Cup. I've seen them come close. I've seen them get to a point in 1993 where they should have been playing the Montreal Canadiens for the Stanley Cup. But then a little player named Wayne Gretzky got away with a high stick. They sent the wrong guy to the penalty box, and then the guy who should have been in the box scored the game-winning goal. Yes, I'm still bitter about 1993. Get over it. I'm not. You get over it. I'm going to be bitter for that for a long time. 
Anyways, the Toronto Maple Leafs are my team. Through thick and thin, through lows and highs. Granted, there hasn't been many highs recently. I mean, I think they've missed the playoffs now eight years in a row. So this could be... I, th- I th- actually think it's at seven in this. This year would be eight if they don't make the playoffs. So uh, I'm hoping that they do so that it isn't eight. But I, I could be wrong. It could be eight going on nine years. But either way, they haven't made the playoffs in so long. Uh, I'm a Toronto Blue Jays fan. They haven't made the playoffs since 1993 when they won their second World Series. So, I mean, that's almost 20 years ago. So, yes, I know what it's like to be a fan. New England Patriots fans? Now, granted, there are some New England Patriots fans that were Patriots fans before they were winning the Super Bowl. However, I would say a good chunk, I'm saying probably in the upper echelons of 75-80% to of their fans, quote-unquote fans, I'm using quotation fingers again that you can't see, only became fans after they won the Super Bowl, and that pisses me off. Moving on to the NFC, I picked the San Francisco 49ers to defeat the Green Bay Packers, and they did. The Green Bay Packers, I said, did not look very good against the Minnesota Vikings when they won 24-10. I thought they should have clobbered the Minnesota Vikings, because the Minis- especially when Minnesota didn't have their quarterback. I actually predicted Minnesota to make that game very close, and even though it was a 14-point difference, it should have been more. There should have been more points put up by Green Bay, and they should have dominated more defensively. Like, it was just a fiasco. Um, So when I saw that, I said Green Bay did not win that game. Minnesota lost that game. Kind of like Denver or Baltimore did not win their game. Denver lost the game. Um, Going into San Francisco, playing in Candlestick Park, or whatever it's called now, um, Green Bay did not have the team that I thought they could that they could beat the San Francisco 49ers. Now, granted, they put up 31 points against San Francisco, which would have probably beat most teams. In fact, looking around, um, actually, they only would have beat three teams, so uh, maybe not. There was a lot of points put up this weekend. 31 points against San Francisco should... Uh, it is good because San Francisco has great defense. But I just knew San Francisco had way more offensively and could answer every point that Rodgers could put up. And the problem is Green Bay has no defense. There's nobody on that team that knows how to stop a run. They don't know how to stop a pass. San Francisco racked up 45 points. And I'm just going to open up a little window here just to see what some of the statistics were. Because I know for a fact that Colin... Uh, Callen, Colin, Col- yeah, Colin Kaepernick uh, set records uh, for a quarterback in the playoffs, and uh, I'm just blown away that they put up 45 points against the Green Bay Packers. Okay, let me see here. Uh, okay, Colin Kaepernick passed for 263 yards and two touchdowns. However, he also rushed for 181 yards and two touchdowns. Frank Gore himself rushed for 119 yards. That's over. That's 200. That's 300 yards. Sorry, 300 yards rushing by a quarterback and a running back. And those are just the top two statistics for for the rushing. And then you add in the 263 yards passing. Like I mean, seriously. I don't know why Green Bay even thought they had a chance. So San Francisco's moving on to the NFC Championship game, where they will be playing. And here's where I got another one wrong, the Atlanta Falcons. The Atlanta Falcons were winning 20-0 to going into halftime. They scored a last-second field goal to win the game 30-28. to Seattle came all the way back and took a one-point lead with just over 38 seconds remaining. Now, I will say this. With 38 seconds remaining, Atlanta actually got into field goal range and kicked the field goal, and they deserved that win, sort of. I still think Seattle is the better team. Seattle had a couple of plays in the first half where if they would have kicked field goals instead of going for it, would have actually won this game easily. Uh, Maybe some bad coaching decisions during the game, but that being said, Seattle made a huge comeback. They were down 20 to nothing and took the lead 28-27 with uh, 38 seconds or so remaining, and then Atlanta ended up getting the game-winning field goal, which also was missed initially. However, 
Seattle had called the timeout, and you know, so they re-kicked it, and he got it again. Uh, one of the commentators and said something, and I totally agree with him. If you're gonna call a timeout to quote unquote ice the kicker, do it before they're ready to kick. Because if you give that kicker a chance to kick the ball, and whether he gets it or misses it, you've just given him a mulligan. And I hate using golf terminology, but you've given him a do-over. Because basically he's now just kicked that ball. He says, okay, so that's what it did when I did that. He can correct that now. Now you've given him a chance to correct it. I've seen pro myself personally 15 kicks where t opposite teams call a timeout just as the ball is about to be snapped. So they call the timeout, but the ball still gets snapped. The play still happens, but the play doesn't count because the time has been called. I've seen that 15 times. 14 out of those 15 times? So, sorry, let me rephrase that. 8 out of those 15 times, not 14, I was thinking of something else. 8 out of those 15 times, the kick was missed for the first time. Of those 8, all 8 were made the second time. Now, here's what I'm saying. 14 out of those 15 times, uh... The play, the the kicker r ran the play. The fifth, the the last time, the one time, uh, the kicker didn't actually run to kick the ball. So, but the the ball was snapped and held. The kicker just he heard the whistle and didn't follow through. So uh, you can't, I can't say what what happened on that. So that was kind of, but the ball was hiked. So I was just including it. But eight times out of eight, out of the fourteen times that I have seen. The kick that was missed was then made. So, coaches, call the timeout before. We know you're going to do it. Just make sure you do it before the, the ball is, is snapped. Like, with like three or four seconds before this ball is snapped. So that the referees have time to not get the ball snapped. So that kicker doesn't get that, uh, that do-over kick, that free kick, to see how the conditions are. So that sets up. The conference championships for this weekend. So this weekend, we've got the 49ers going into Atlanta to take on the Falcons in the NFC Championship game. And we've got the Baltimore Ravens heading into New England to take on the Patriots in the AFC Championship game. I'm going to give you picks. My picks for this week are the San Francisco 49ers defeating the Atlanta Falcons in Atlanta. Because, as I said before, I think Atlanta's... Uh, they, they gave up... They should have lost, honestly, against Seattle. So while I picked Seattle to go in into Atlanta and defeat them, and they didn't, I'm still picking the 49ers to go into Atlanta and defeat them, just because I think the Falcons have a a suspect defense and they have a demoralized offense. Uh, when I saw the sidelines when Seattle made it 28 to 27, they were dejected. They got lucky to get into field goal range with the time remaining that they had. And like I said, the, the that timeout probably ruined it for uh, the Seattle Seahawks. I think if they hadn't called the timeout, they would have won the game. I think also if they had maybe... Um, I don't know what else they could have done differently. Maybe taken more time off the clock before scoring the touchdown. Uh, sometimes you have no choice in that matter. But... For whatever reason, the Seattle Seahawks came back from being down 20 to nothing. If the Seattle Seahawks can do that to Atlanta, the 49ers are going to roll over the Falcons. I'm not calling a blowout, but I'm going to say there's going to be probably 10 points between these two teams, and the 49ers are going to go on to the Super Bowl. <sighs> the AFC Championship game. I really wanted Denver there because I thought that with Denver... They would, the Patriots would have had to go to Denver to play in the Mile High Stadium, um, and I think that would have given Denver such a great advantage. Baltimore going to New England, I'm not so fond of. My heart wants Baltimore to win. I would love to see Ray Lewis go to the Super Bowl one last time, uh, and I also hate the Patriots. However, statistics. Everything else I know about football says the Patriots are probably going to win. So my official pick is going to be the New England Patriots. My heart picks the Baltimore Ravens. 
But uh, so that means I'm calling for 49ers Patriots Super Bowl, and that could be very interesting indeed. I would accept a 49ers Ravens one. Don't get me wrong. I'd rather be one for two next week. But I think the 49ers for sure, and then the Patriots just because they're they're still the New England Patriots as much as I hate them. They still can put up points. Now, granted, they won't have Gronkowski, but if Sean Vereen can play like he did last game, I mean. They don't need Gronkowski. So, I, I I hate the Patriots, but they're probably going to another Super Bowl where I hope they will lose once again. It won't be to the New York Giants this time, but I still hope they lose once again. So, that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed the Warlock Hour, even though the Warlock Hour is quite, quite long. Uh, it is just going to be... Um, coming up on an hour and a half now but i hope you enjoyed it uh remember to tune in every week warlock wednesdays and uh on anotherpodcast.com so that's e-h-n-o-t-h-e-r podcast.com or you can find us on itunes under another podcast have a good one good week everyone and i'll see you next wednesday Hey everyone, thanks for listening to the podcast, anotherpodcast.com. It's where you can find your network. This is a network now. Uh, Mondays is Another Podcast. Tuesdays, Real Music with OJ and myself. Wednesdays is Warlock Wednesdays with Ray. We're starting off, we're going good, so we need you to participate. Yes, you can email anotherpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can send us in any questions that you would like us to answer things to talk about on another podcast or real music or i can forward them on to ray for warlock wednesdays also there's a youtube channel um another podcast on youtube you just look up another podcast there's some videos uploaded already we're hoping to go strong with that and some other projects we have uh on the go so we are trying to build a network we're trying to go seven days a week so uh sundays is already taking it will be starting up soon uh, comics with Mikey, I think I'm going to call it. Comics with Mikey. And then uh, that will, w- won't necessarily be a podcast. It's going to be um, an actual uh, comic strip that you can go and read on sun- on Sundays. So we need four other shows. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Wait, that's three. Yeah, we only need three. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So we need some independent podcasters out there who want to podcast for free. Yeah, that's right. Free. That's what I'm doing for you. I'm going to host it. I'm paying for it. I want to get my money's worth out of what I've paid for. So, if you are Canadian, that's the one rule. Maybe we'll do one import. Just like the Canadian Football League, we'll have an import player. So, But uh, I'll work that out later. Uh, So, if you want to podcast once a week for free, anotherpodcast at gmail.com. Email me, hit me up, and we will work on it. I'll get you the details. Try to talk you through what I know, which is limited. No, not it's not that bad. And uh, we'll make it easy for you. Uh, things are going good. The website's getting hits. I love it. I love you for listening in to it, um, if I can speak plain English today. Thanks for listening. Anotherpodcast.com. Another podcast on Twitter. So you just go Another Podcast. And, uh, yeah, you can also follow me at the real APOC on Twitter. So thanks for listening. Come back every day for more. Um, and, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Bye.